but if they don't have the gospel, yeah. how would you how would you concisely? And I know there's going to be mistakes, but how would you concisely explain that gospel in the shortest period of time with clarity as much as possible? Yeah. But I'm Mormon. Hey, yeah. I'll give you three minutes. Three minutes. What do you do? I I would I would turn to. Uh, it's it's hard. This is hard mm -hmm. because, like I'm saying. Um, that's like telling me uh, you've got a person who only speaks Mandarin, Chinese. How are you going to communicate the gospel with them in three minutes or less? It's like, right? gosh, I'm going to have to learn Mandarin first to be able to do it. I can't do it, right? It's going to be really hard. Okay, But the key is going to be, I think, what I, what I would try to do is walk through Romans 4 and Genesis 15. Okay, So when you look at what Genesis 15 says about the covenant that Abraham goes through, it is a covenant that is unilateral. Unilateral covenant. As opposed to the Mosaic Covenant, which is bilateral. Can you say those again? Yeah. So the covenant that God makes with Abraham, um, that God makes with Moses is bilateral. If you do this, follow my words, then you get blessings. Okay? The covenant that God makes with Abraham is unilateral. He just straight up makes the promises and then says, and I'm on the hook to fulfill them. All you have to do to enter into this covenant with me is trust that I will uphold this covenant. So he has no obligations. It's like Galatians, right? And so, and, and in Romans 4, uh, Romans 4, uh, it, uh, there's a lot of places to look, but, but Galatians will get you there, too. studying Galatians this week, that's why I said that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and in Romans 4, he walks through that exact covenant and says, and it's the, he, that God didn't say to Abraham that he believed that it was credited to him as righteousness for Abraham alone, but also for us. So I would say that that same covenant, that unilateral covenant, is uh, is the covenant that we as Christians grab a hold to, that when we trust that uh, in Christ and His sacrifice, then that's enough. And so that's the key that I'm going to try to hit on. I'm going to try to get them, and I find that Genesis 15 and Romans 4, that those two passages work together really well to hit this. But what I am wanting desperately for them to understand is that for them, Jesus is is necessary for salvation, but he's insufficient. Trusting Jesus is necessary, but insufficient. He's not enough. Because you have to add to him, you have to add to his stuff, all the things in the temple, all the covenants that you're going to make and keep his work for me. His promises are mine to grab a hold of. Nothing, I don't have to add anything to it. I trust him and God um, uh, is the is the savior in that sense? He saves me. It's not about the works I have to do to stay in covenant or to get in covenant. It's like I, I trusted him in him, and that's enough. Right? In fact, I had a, a Mormon missionary. My wife and I were talking to, and the Mormon missionary. A lot of Mormons um, seem to assume that the reason why some Christians stay Christian is because uh, we could we, we maybe we think that there's too many rules and we couldn't hack it as Mormons. We had, you know, like it would be too much. To, we'd have to give up, you know, coffee. We'd have to, we'd have to do the word of wisdom, and we just don't, we, we can't, we couldn't hack it, right? And so that's why we're not Mormon. And so this Mormon missionary, I think this is why she asked, but she asked my wife, um, what would you have to change? What would change to become Mormon? What would change for you to become Mormon? And my wife kind of thought about it for a minute, and she said, you know. Here's what would change. For me to become Mormon would mean that one day I would have to stand before Jesus and tell him, you weren't enough. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that would change more than anything else. Is that for her right now, Jesus is enough. That I, I trust in him fully and he is sufficient for my salvation. Uh, if, I, if I became Mormon, I, I'd have to abandon that thought. He's not enough. He was a part, but not the whole. And so I'm try that's the thing that I need them to see so they can see the radical difference between the two. That for them, Jesus, and they might even fight you on this, and they might even say, no, 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 he's enough, he's sufficient, and then you just point to the temple and you say, well, then what the heck is that <laughs> building for? Yeah. If he's enough, then what do I have to do over there that, that, that's required for me to get the highest levels of heaven? Or you can ask them, well, do I have to pay a tithe to your church in order to, get, to qualify for the highest kingdom? Yes. I have to pay to get there, right? Now, if they said, well, don't you get rewards well, in your idea as we, well? well? Yeah, but, but the thief on the cross dies without one good work to his name. He dies without one good work, and Jesus says, today you're going to be in paradise. And I know that they have a different view of paradise than we do. And again, this is why these conversations are tough, uh, right? But the two places where the word paradise ever comes up in Scripture, 
are besides when Jesus tells the thief that on the cross. As they talk about paradise in regards to creation story. They talk about paradise in the book of Revelation. Talking about the tree of, uh, of life that's in paradise. Of the paradise of God. Uh, what is Jesus talking about? when he's, It's the place where the throng of believers gather before the Lord. And proclaim his holiness and his worthiness uh, forevermore. This is the only paradise that exists, biblically speaking. Now, I know you can create theological concepts of other things that you call paradise, but you just talk to the Bible. What, is, what does Jesus say this man has? It, it's, it's eternal life with, heaven, with, their, with his heavenly Father in the presence of Jesus forevermore. Um, and he has that on the basis of his trust in Jesus without one good work to his name. Can I do a follow-up to that just real quick? Yeah, good. Um, I've had people there. I don't. I think they're completely wrong, but I'll give it to you, okay? Um, what, what if I'm a Mormon and I don't believe those additional things are necessary? I trust alone in Jesus' sacrifice that I will die and enter into some level of heaven. Mm -hmm. But I am trusting alone in Jesus' work on the cross. And, and they'll say, don't you think that I'm saved now? Uh -huh. So I, I suppose I would ask them, why would you stay in an organization that teaches different than that? Yeah. Why, why, why would you stay in an organization that teaches you that that's not true? Um, but wouldn't it be 100% different Jesus? It's not that yeah, so, so you could, yeah, so there's a variety of ways you could go. I think the, right. the first, my knee-jerk re response would be, then why the heck? Right. If you're in a church that teaches a different... A different thing than what you're believing, you've already rejected them. Why not reject uh, them further? Step out. But you're right. But you could go a number of different ways talking about their view of who God is, who Jesus is, all kinds of other things. Yeah. So you're, you're educated, just for these guys and myself. Uh, we're not saved by theology, right? But we are saved by right uh, our God, but right thinking is necessary. Yeah. Because if you think that. You're saved by faith in Jesus, but when you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about a blueberry that's on a bush somewhere in Wisconsin. That's not going to save you. That blueberry can't save you, right? Like, like faith, the object of your faith is extraordinarily important, right? It's not just having faith doesn't save anyone. Uh, it's what the faith is in. It's the object of your faith. And so if your Jesus is um, a created... Uh, or organized being, um, then that's not the that's not the, the correct object of faith, and that created being, or organized being, can't save you. Right. Only the incarnate Christ can save you. Yeah, Gabriel. So, Lauren, just anticipating, they go to uh, Temple Square and they're talking with sisters, and they bring up prophecies that uh, Joseph Smith said that weren't fulfilled, and they bring up the, the temple yep. in Missouri. And they say, look, it says in this generation, I've done that, you've done that, yeah. Rob's done that. Yeah. The automatic response by the LDS is, well, Jesus talked about a generation in some prophecies too. Yeah. What do you say? I'm There's supposed to be a generation and not a couple of these things. Two things about that that I would say. Um, the first one is, <laughs> the easiest answer is um, what did the next prophets and apostles think Joseph Smith meant by that? And uh, because more prophecies came up where uh, people uh, like Orson Pratt or Lorenzo Snow said things like speaking at General Conference again that uh, because Joseph Smith gave that prophecy, uh, there are people in this room who will not taste death before that prophecy comes true. Uh, as sure as the sun will rise tomorrow, that, that prophecy will not fall to the ground because, you know, Joseph Smith gave it, and that's a done deal. So, so the first thing, easier answer, is understanding what did the LDS people who talked about that prophecy after Joseph Smith's death and, and apostles and prophets, what did they say about it? And they, they thought it meant literally people in that room would all would still be alive when that happened. So that's the first answer. The second answer is uh, a little bit more, is an interpretive question. And the, the these things, I think, in that passage is talking about what started the conversation, which is the destruction of the temple. So in uh, Jesus walks out of the temple courts and his disciples are saying, man, look at, the, look at these buildings, look at the size of the stones, like isn't it amazing? And Jesus says, not one stone will be left upon another. And he uses the words, uh, the, uh, uh, the word these things. 
And the, 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 they ask him, when will these things happen? And Jesus gives them, he says, these things, the, the, the referent to the these things is the destruction of the temple. And then Jesus takes that as an opportunity to talk about uh, other things that would take place uh, regarding his return and the second coming and all, a lot of these things, uh, a lot of other things. Um, and then at the end, he says, and these things, talking again, I think specifically about the destruction of the temple, will not pass away. But he says, but when you see, he uses the victory analogy, but when you see the one, the other is close behind. And so the these things is destruction of the temple, and then the Lord will come quickly. Now, we've been asking that question, you know, quickly, like, it's been a couple thousand years, quickly means something different, apparently, to God than it means to us, so we're still waiting, but... I think that these things in this generation, he says these things will happen in this generation, it's the destruction of the temple, which did happen in 70 AD. That's what I would help them understand that. So that's in um, Matthew 24 and, and Mark uh, 13. Yeah. Okay, so another question about the temple prophecy by Joseph Smith. I, I think I was doing um, just a practice conversation with Moses or something, but... I was like, so Joseph Smith prophesied about the temple, and it's not there. And he said, like, oh, well, us Mormons think that it's a temple of spirit. Like, what would you say to that? That's just, that has nothing to do with what Joseph Smith said. He's standing on the spot saying it's happening right here, and he labeled it in Independence, Missouri. Like, here it is. And marks the spot, you know, dedicates it. And, um, and not only that, but again, like I said, the next wave of apostles and prophets who come next all affirm that same belief. No, it's going to be in that spot that he marked out in Mark 17, 4, um, that he personally stood there and marked out the spot. So there's no sense of the only reason you would uh, re, you would go to that step is because it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to come up with some way to rationalize something that, that didn't happen. So uh, there's, there's, there's no hint that that's a spiritual thing. It's very I mean, and he built other temples, so that's a very concrete thing he was doing in temples. Any other questions? Comments? Yeah. Um, like, how, do, like, how does the LDS church go through the process of like, finding the prophet and kind of getting, I guess, back to the work? So, it's a pretty straightforward procedure. Um, they have 12 apostles, a prophet, and two counselors. And um, so there's 15 apostles, essentially. There's 15, 12 apostles. So <laughs> they, they count all the, the president, the, the prophet, and his two counselors. They're, all, they're also apostles, and then they're 12 apostles. When a prophet dies, the two counselors, this is the way to think about it, they kind of get put back down into that group or quorum of apostles. So there are 14 um, the, the, the longest standing apostle then gets put into the prophet role. He chooses two counselors. He wants to be his counselors. And then they draft a new person to fill the spot in the, in the, in the apostles. So it's a pretty clockwork kind of thing. Kind of the same way that. That's just weird to say it's like a prophet isn't is just something that's scheduled. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it, for them it's just the longest standing apostle. And typically, that's why it's always like people that are in their 80s. Is that found anywhere in their scriptures? Mm, I don't think so. I think that's just sort of a, you guys know that, that's not a scriptural thing, right? I think that's just sort of practice. That's how they do it. So, so they, I guess they don't know how they figured it out. They could, yeah, they could go a different route, I guess, if they wanted. But it's just sort of like the people with most seniority call the shots, and that's what they've always sort of done. Is that policy? Policy. Yeah. I got just for like kind of more like a practical question. Uh -huh. So like this afternoon, we're going to break into groups and kind of tour around some of the other buildings yeah. at Temple Square we didn't see. And, you know, we'd like to get into conversations yeah. with people in the buildings. And then oh, so one question is um, the best way to communicate with people in the buildings and then like outside of the buildings to get into a little bit more yeah. pointed gospel conversations, just more of like the location where that should be. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, I don't think there's any spot that's off limits. If you, and so questions that you can ask, you, you may already have a list, short list of questions you like to ask to engage, but things like, uh, this is one my friend Randy Sweet used to always use, but he, 
he would always say, uh, what's your favorite part about being a Mormon or being LDS? What's the best part about being LDS? Just give them kind of free reign to tell you what's the best. And then oftentimes what comes from that is they will ask you, what are you? What's the best thing about being Christian or, or whatever you call yourself? Or after they kind of tell you their thing, you say, Matt, I'm super glad that you shared that with me. Can I share with you the best thing about being uh, Christian? And then, and then I would go right into um, uh, that Jesus is, is uh, sufficient. That, that trusting in him is enough for eternal life. So we can get in, engage in conversations, do all those things in the temple area. Oh, yeah. But is there particular places, you know, designated free speech zones where you could actually distribute literature and stuff? Because you're not oh, supposed no. to do that within the temple. Distributing anything you cannot do, yeah, in, in not, the temple grounds. In the temple grounds. In fact, I would be, I would be slow to uh, bring out any kind of materials in your conversations with, with people in the, on, the, on the temple grounds. But on the um, street and sidewalk around Temple Square, that's public. You can distribute stuff there. So probably don't even bring out like your Book of Mormon, stuff like that on Temple they, Grounds? The, the missionaries will probably have one. Okay. So I would just use that. Oh, okay. And then, I mean, that puts a little bit of a burden on you to maybe memorize some stuff. I mean, you can have it. You can use it. I'm not saying don't use it. You why, can. Why, why would they be suspicious of you walking around with Book of Mormon? Yeah. Because of all my tabs. With all the tabs. <laughs> yeah. It's you possible. I don't this? worry too much about it, but if, <laughs> you can, if you can say, hey, I see a Book of Mormon. Can we read something? And they won't have a Doctrine and Covenants on them, though, most likely. They could. Sometimes they have tablets and they can get to anything. So, but um, everything needs one Bible. But uh, yeah, I would, I would, uh, I'd try to engage with what they have on them. It's a little less threatening. Now. Do they carry Bibles with them usually, or Not just? Usually. Oh. Usually yeah. on the temple grounds, it's usually the book of Bible. Okay. All right. What other questions, students? Yeah. I... Um. Another. Uh, another good question to ask a Mormon or to ask a missionary is just to ask them, um, have you ever had an evangelical Christian share the gospel? Hmm. So what they say. If they say yes, you, you, can, you can ask, what did they say? <laughs> and see what they understood the person to say, right? Um, if they say no, then you say, can I, uh, what, can I take an opportunity to, to share the gospel? As an evangelical, can I share it? I doubt they're gonna say no, like that'd be kind of, Weird if they were like, no, you can't share that with me. Maybe they'd say no, but you can just ask them that. So those are just a couple of like easy questions as you're going. You're walking from one site to another. Maybe you're kind of they'll, they'll get up and they'll kind of do a little spiel if you're with a missionary group at a, at, a, at a particular place. Let them do their spiel. They'll do some Q and A. I always find that the best places for me to have conversation with them are in transit from one spot to another. So as you're walking from one place to another. You, you, you come alongside of and just say, hey, where are you from? How long have you been a Mormon? What's the best part about being Mormon? You know, how long have, did you grow up in the LDS church? Where did you grow up? When did it become your own? How did, what's the best thing? How's an evangelical church? You just, you can kind of do that more conversationally just as you go. And that is, seems to be a little more non-threatening. They get, I mean, if you're in a group where they're sitting here like this giving a presentation and you guys are firing at them, you might get a little bit worried. I don't know. Uh, Find a kind of relational, kind of walking, personal thing is a lot more open. And you can do that with, as you're kind of, I don't know what your experience will be like, but oftentimes there's missionaries walking around, and it, it, at any time you see two gals walking, and, you know, and you, you, the two of the, like the sister missionaries, you can just, you can just wave, smile, where are you from, have you been, have you guys been in the LDS church your whole life, or would you come later, and they'll tell you, and you can just, it's really easy to start a conversation. Um, they want to have conversations with you. That's why they're there. Their goal, just so you know, is is to get is to not answer all your questions, but to try to get a follow up visit of missionaries to come to your house later. That's kind of their goal. So they're not there to like engage fully. So you may get frustrated at times when you get to a, po a place where you feel like you're about to get into something good, and then they kind of back off and say. I prayed about it. I know it's true. I'd like to. We'd like to send missionaries to visit you sometime, and um, I'd say just go with that. Say yeah. Sign them up. Have them come. <laughs> send them to your youth pastor's house. Yes. Them to, 
I I'll take them. Yeah, we used to, we used to uh, anyone who wasn't on the trip, we would put their name and address on them. <laughs> <laughs> who wasn't on the trip. Um, one thing that you will come in contact with, if you haven't already, is uh, the, the, the Mormon testimony, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, we're not here to debate. I'm just telling you what I believe and I've prayed about it and God told me it's true. How have you guys been handling that when you get that kind of a, when you get to that place in the conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've kind of been taught to question like their feelings, like you decide anything else with feelings, mm -hmm. and then like kind of point out that the feelings are like a good indicator of something. Or in the scriptures that talk about the, the deepness of the heart mm -hmm. and the Bereans and how they chose if it was telling the truth, not things like that. Yeah. You know. Yeah, how do you do that? That's the question. How, so how does that, 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 that work? Have you had success in that? their one goal in life is to be able to share their testimony with you. So they'll get there. Yeah. Yeah, we had a couple people share their testimony with us. Yeah. And we just like kind of admired it at first, like some things we sharing. Mm. It's a beautiful story. Yeah. And, like I guess pointed out when they talked about like Jesus saving them and stuff. Or like ask questions about it too. Yeah. 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 Um, my approach on that sometimes is uh, just depends on the person. It's always very different. But one of the things that I'll do is try to help them see that relying on feelings to make spiritual decisions uh, isn't a great a great way to do it. So I'll I'll oftentimes ask, like, hey, do you have a if it's an older person, like a, a I'll say, do you have a, do you have any kids? Or if it's a younger person, do you have any brothers or sisters? Um, and yeah, I have, we have a little sister. And I say, well, what would you do if she showed up one day and she was like, I was in the grocery store and I met this guy and um, and he he's a part he runs this like polygamous suicide cult or group or whatever I mean, they call it a cult and um, and he wanted me to join it and I was like, that's dumb. I would never do that. And then he said, just pray about it and ask God. And then she goes home, and she said, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I thought it was terrible, but I, but I prayed, and I got this feeling like I've never got before. Like it, was, like it was more clearly true just in my heart than anything I've ever heard. And so I'm going to go join this group. Like then, I, then I say, so, so what, how, what would you tell your sister? Would you be like, oh, awesome, follow your heart? Like, no. Like nobody in their right mind would ever say that because you're – consigning your, your sister to abhorrent things, right? And so, so what would you say, though? If, if, if feelings really are the final arbiter of spiritual truth, and she's great about it and feels this more than she's ever felt anything before in her life, what are you going to say? And typically, they're going to say, well, no, I don't think God would say that. And you say, well, okay, but how would you test? How would you know? And they, sometimes they'll say something like, well, because, you know, in, in, in the Bible, God, it's not like that or something. And, and then it's, you know, it's great when something like that happens where they kind of give you a test. And the test is what Scripture says. And Scripture sits in judgment over the religious feeling. And I'd say, I just totally affirm that, first of all. Like, I think Scripture is a good judge over spiritual feelings and spiritual experience, not vice versa. I think it goes, my spiritual experiences don't sit in judgment over the Bible. The Bible sits in spiritual judgment over that, and then we go to Deuteronomy 18 and say, here, let me show you what, what God says about how we test the prophet. More than me praying about Joseph Smith and asking if he's a prophet, I can look to Scripture to judge that, right? Because in the same way, I don't have to sit here and ask God, God, should I murder someone today? Anyone have to do that in the morning? You don't, right? Why? Because he's already told you not to do that, right? So if God has already told you how to test the prophet, then why would I create a new test about praying and asking something if he's already told me how to do Deuteronomy 18? So let's just use that test. It's a sure way. And then go through the test of the prophet. Yeah, Jeremiah 17, 18. Yeah. 
questions? Sure. So if you guys, if you guys um, get on the road and get out there and uh, have some interaction with some other guest folks, I think, again, I just appreciate that you're here. Appreciate the time you put into studying and learning. Appreciate you for bringing teams out here. And uh, we, need, we need a lot more of that uh, out here for sure. So let's just let me just pray for you. So God, we thank you for the incredible grace that you show us, uh, a grace that is what we need, but it's also sufficient for our condition, God. We uh, rely wholly and completely on the finished work of the cross. God, we thank you for your grace that was uh, given to us uh, so freely, God, uh, so lovingly, so that we can know, God, where we stand with you, that you, uh, more than just my testimony or someone else's testimony, God, you have given us your testimony. That uh, anyone who has a son has life, and whoever does not have a son does not have eternal life. God, we can know where we stand with you. What a privilege and honor it is to uh, know that we walk with you now and forever. And Lord, I pray that from that place, God, you would just give us a joy and a peace that um, uh, is just uh, running over in these conversations that will go on today and for the rest of the time here in Utah, Lord, that that, that freedom and that that joy of knowing you and walking with you would just be uh, experienced by those LDS people around them. They would just see that, God, and that they would be attracted to that. And that in that moment, God, there'd be an opening for real gospel conversation. That uh, more than just uh, words going back and forth, but, but really getting uh, a place of understanding, understanding and hearing the gospel and, and learning why uh, God, you are, and how you protected us from people like Joseph Smith and others who would try to gain spiritual authority over other people, God. But, uh, but Lord, you'd help help uh, clear conversations to happen in that regard. We pray that uh, that in every conversation that comes up, God, you would be uh, by your Spirit just there and in a part of those conversations, guiding God, giving wisdom beyond even our own studying ability, but giving us uh, words to say, Lord, so that we could just be clear about the gospel and that people. That they interact with would hear and would and would even be able to respond, God, to uh, what you've uh, uh, what you've given them to say. So we pray for their time today. We pray that it would be fruitful, Lord. We pray that good conversations would happen, that even uh, longer term relationships would develop with people, and uh, that you would be at work through all of that uh, in your power by your Spirit. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.